Neil Burton is a psychiatrist, philosopher, writer and wine lover who teaches in Oxford. He was born in Mauritius and grew up in Switzerland. He studied medicine and neuroscience in London before specialising in psychiatry and also reading for a master's in philosophy. He's written some 16 books, academic, non-fiction and fiction, and has won awards for his writing. Neil Burton, welcome to Shrinkwrap Radio. Thank you, Missy. It's nice to be here. It's lovely to have you, and it's an incredibly impressive CV. Can you give us a sense of how you came to take this path with all those varied interests and what your work now entails? Um, well, you know, you say it's an impressive CV, and um, it's interesting because, you know, I, I have, I have an uncomfortable relationship with, with CVs. And uh, for, for a period, I, I decided to um, not have a CV. And uh, for a few years, I didn't have a CV. Uh, and people would often write to me and say, can we have a copy of your CV? And I would say, no, I don't have a CV. <laughs> and, and they would reply, well, oh, that's very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> There's excitement in mystery. <laughs> so, so, you know. <laughs> but anyway, to answer your question, um, I, my CV is very impressive. Okay, how did I get there? I don't know. I didn't plan it, to be honest. <laughs> I just followed my, my passion, I guess, and, um, and I ended up where, where I am. And you teach, you teach as well as practice and work with patients? Yes, I, I do a little bit of clinical practice, but mainly I'm a writer nowadays. So I spend most of my time uh, writing, um, and writing in, in, the broad, in the broad sense of writing, which is not just sitting at your desk and... Uh, and uh, uh, and typing, but also you know walking around and having thoughts, which is probably the most fun bit of being a writer. Oh, and I think I think we'll be talking a little bit about boredom later, which kind of ties into that. But I'll save that for a little bit later on. <laughs> um, for for now, maybe we can focus on your book, Growing from Depression. And mm. it is a short book, but it was so it's bursting with practical advice, with helpful information, and real inspiration. I think both for practitioners, but really for for clients, for patients, for service users as well. And you start out by explaining the complexity of diagnosis and definition. Mm. Could you just re recount a little bit of what you wanted readers to take home from that discussion? Well, I think that um, it's quite it's quite a complex it's quite a big question you just asked me. But I think that you know the, the, the there's a there's a there's a diagnostic problem with depression, which is that we've defined what the, the, depression is, and then we diagnose depression on the basis of that definition. And the definition is pretty loose, and the whole process is pretty circular. Um, and so, I think what has this this what this has led to is an overdiagnosis of depression in our society. Um, that basically, uh, you know, is depression a biological illness of the brain? Uh, perhaps. Uh, certainly, I've seen patients in psychiatric hospitals with very severe depression who are mute and stuporous, who can't speak, who can't move, uh, and who, who, who are at immediate risk of death, actually, from, from not eating and drinking. And um, so that, that sort of depression exists. But then there's so much more on the spectrum that is being diagnosed as depression. And is that really helpful? Um, and I, I think that's, that's an important question. That, at the bottom of the diagnosis of depression. And I found your theory about the higher incidence among females to be interesting as well. You suggested for one thing that males might show different behaviors, but also I'm wondering from, from what you just said, whereas there might be an inclination to, to, to label sad women as, as depressive, or am I just um, making that up? Um, well, you're, you're right. So it means um, I, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, these are statistics. So if you look at, if you look at the last time I look at the statistics, I think a woman is twice more likely to be diagnosed with depression than, than a man. So that's quite a significant difference. Now, why is there that difference? I think there's many, many factors, um, you know, but, but, you know, in, in some way, perhaps some women have harder lives than, than some men, you know, they have to cope with their career as well as with raising children and the pressure tends to be more on them than on their partner 
So, so there is that. Then there's also some biological differences between men and women. So, so women have uh, uh, have uh, hormonal cycles which might affect their 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 mood. So their, their mood might be more uh, unstable or labile. Um, but I think there's a huge social cultural component to it as well. So women are more likely, are more expressive. So they're more likely to go to their GP and talk about feeling sad, feeling depressed, whereas men will tend to bottle it all in uh, more. And I, I hate dealing in generalizations, but, but that, 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 that's how it is. And um, may express their sort of dissatisfaction uh, in different ways. So rather than saying, I'm sad, they might say, um, they might be angry, or they might um, uh, hit the bottle, for, for instance, you know, so, so men will have different coping strategies, and women will have different coping strategies. And that social cultural sort of uh, uh, bias, if you like, is also present in the doctors while making the diagnosis. So maybe that a doctor, a GP, uh, is more likely to diagnose a, a woman with depression than, than he or she is a man with depression. So th I think it's, it's quite complicated, but there is that difference and it's probably multifactorial. And you're mentioning those sociocultural differences. And as someone who's multilingual and has lived in very different countries, could you talk, also talk about how language and culture affect both incidents and diagnosis? Because I found that really interesting in your book as well. And I so, don't quite <laughs> across those yeah, ideas. That's a very good question. Um, so... I was reading a book called uh, Depression in Japan. I can't quite remember the name of the author at the moment, but anyway, a book called Depression in Japan. And she was arguing, she's an anthropologist, and she was arguing in that book that uh, before roughly the 80s, I think, or the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, people, the, the lay person in Japan didn't, re didn't even have a concept of depression. So depression was not a thing in Japan. Only certain psychiatrists had heard of it, you know, it, it was, people didn't go around saying I'm depressed. But then um, things started changing and I think there was a marketing campaign by a drug company uh, in Japan to help sell the new SSRI antidepressants. And psychiatrists became much more informed about depression and started spreading the word. And so um, depression became a huge problem in Japan um, over the course of just a decade or two. And so I think that that's, that's what, roughly what she argues in her book. And I thought that was very interesting. And it shows that there's a, there's a huge uh, social cultural component to, to mental disorder and how we label our distress. So for example, if you look at Africa, uh, people in Africa, well, you know, in most African societies, people don't self-harm. Self-harm is unknown, you know, like cutting your wrists and wrists and taking overdoses, which is very common in the West. That actually doesn't exist in many, uh, many African societies at all. Uh, and if you look uh, at, at, soci at societies um, before the West became a sort of dominant factor, um, a dominant force, you see that each society has a different sort of uh, range of mental disorders by which uh, people in that society can express their distress. Yeah. And these are, these are like sort of, um, you know, templates, if you like, uh, that people can, can understand, that people can read. And maybe depression is, is a template like that, but it's a template for the West. And what we have done is that we've exported that template. We tend to act quite imperialistically in terms of mental health. So we have our uh, American classification of mental disorders, the DSM and the World Health Organization uh, classification of mental disorders, the ICD now 11. Um, but these classifications, though they purport to be sort of uh, you know, universal and apply to all human beings, are actually Western creations. And if you go to, uh, to a traditional society in Borneo or in the Amazon rainforest, um, their way of expressing the stress, their range of mental disorders is going to be very, very different and have probably very little to do with the ICD-10 or DSM, uh, ICD-11 or DSM-5. So, so mental disorders, to an extent, I think, a cultural creation, and we need to be careful because we're exporting it uh, to... to, to um, to, to, to other countries and to other cultures. And that could be doing quite a bit of harm over there. 
Uh, and of course, we have a vested interest in doing that because we sell, we sell the cure. It's, it's really interesting, actually. It brings to mind that I think it's, it's she, Lisa Feldman Barrett, the writer about the idea of emotions as concepts. And so, for example, until you're really given the concept schadenfreude, that feeling is something that's a bit hazy and clouded. Whereas once you know that word and understand mm. it, you can feel schadenfreude and it, it suddenly has a different psychological reality for you. Mm. The limit, the limit of my language is the limit of my world, as Wittgenstein said, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, I loved what you said about depression, and this, this ties in, I, I think, um, being at times a rational response to an imperfect world rather than necessarily something that should be medicalised. You do write so beautifully. As I said, you've won awards for your writing. And I wanted to read uh, one poignant sentence and a longer passage. So if you, if you don't mind listening to your own words being uh, quoted back at you, um, one, the so let me see how I feel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first one. Mm. We must be careful not to confuse our human nature with inadequacy or the tender shoots of wisdom with mental disorder. And the other slightly longer passage. Mm -hmm. If you feel the way you do, it is because your world was simply not good enough for you. You wanted more. You set the bar too high. You could have swept everything under the carpet and pretended, as most people do, that all is for the best in the best of worlds. But instead, you had the strength and integrity to admit that something was amiss. You are ambitious, you are truthful, and you are courageous. And that is why you got ill. And I did find that very, very moving. And um, just wondered if you could comment on, on the point that you're making so beautifully there. So... Yeah, so it's an interesting one, isn't it? That, you know, sometimes we can become what, what we would label as mentally ill, we can become depressed because it's a way of our, it's, it's our way of telling ourselves that there's something wrong with our lives. And that's actually a very healthy thing, a very positive thing. And we can actually benefit a lot from that if we hear the signal, if we heed the signal, and if we act upon it. But if we're constantly being told that actually this is a biological illness of the brain, and you need to take a pill and that's the solution, then you're just going to write it all off as, oh, I've got an illness and I need to take a pill and that's all I need to do. Uh, whereas actually, you're not, you're not, you're no, you're no longer listening to that signal, and then you can get stuck in a rut as a result, and make the things can get worse and worse and worse. And I've seen many patients uh, in my time in clinical practice who've had severe depression, and it was a way of them telling themselves that something had to change, uh, something difficult that they wouldn't accept, and you know, and that's why that's why it was such a such a such a difficult experience for them. So, for example, I had a patient who. Uh, had had a perfect life, if you like, until then. She was a, she had, uh, always had good grades. She went to medical school. She became a doctor. Um, had a perfect family, and but things weren't right. She didn't. It wasn't her her life. She didn't. She didn't feel at home in that life, and so when she came to terms with the fact that maybe she needed a divorce, uh, then her depression lifted. But it was very, very severe until then. Um, and, and it took many months uh, of, of illness for her to come to that resolution. But once she did come to that resolution, she felt much better. Um, and so sometimes, uh, you know, whenever we're having thoughts about, you know, that our life is unsatisfactory, that, that things could be better, that actually things are not as they should be, then we tend to get a bit depressed. But if we think, oh, that's not normal, um, I should always be happy, I should always be smiling, then we'll never really improve things, we'll never get anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. And you can always tell, I find, that when someone's been, ha had depressive thoughts or seen the darker side or, you know, you can, you can tell they're much sort of, they're better company, they're, they're kinder, they're, not, they're, 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 they're better at listening. You, you can, I can almost tell when someone's been through depression at some point and come out the other side they're just much more mindful it's a as you as you called the book growing from depression i mean it is mm. it, it's it it feels like it could be an essential stepping stone on a path to wisdom perhaps mm. well perhaps and uh, there's only there's certainly a, <clears throat> a sort of ap apocryphal ap uh, story about the buddha 
uh, being, you know, who was apparently a prince. Well, that's probably all made up, but he was probably he, it said that he was a prince. And when he left the castle, he became depressed for a while. And then when he came out of the depression, he became the Buddha. But um, there is also a trope in uh, Western myth, and all myth, in fact, of the hero, the hero trope. And, uh, you know, whether it's Odysseus or Hercules or Orpheus or Aeneas or Gilgamesh, uh, at some point the hero, to become a hero, has to travel through hell. He actually literally goes down into the underworld, comes to terms, comes face to face with death, and then re-emerges out of the underworld, out of hell. In the latter part of the book, you you run through a whole host of ideas that could help people. And the broad scope of it truly excited me. I, I hadn't come across something that was just that was so wide ranging before, certainly in a in, in a book about depression. Um, not only things like managing stress and correcting thinking in a in a CBT style fashion, but you talk about Viktor Frankl and phenomenology, about Buddhism as, as you have here, and gratitude practices. What led you to consider so incredibly wild, widely when you were putting that book together? Hmm. I guess it, it, it's not a conscious decision. It just grew organically because I've been blogging for many years uh, on Psychology Today. Um, and, you know, I've been writing articles and, you know, sometimes I have an idea uh, and I write an article on it. Um, for example, I love gardening. I love gardens. And I've noticed that, you know, I've noticed the, 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 the benefits that gardening has on, on, on your mental health. And I wanted to, to write about that. So I wrote an article on phenomenology, tying it up to, to this uh, sort of 19th century movement uh, of, of careful observation of when you pay attention to things, the ego dissolves into that thing. So, um, and, and that means you, you get out of your mind, you get out of your problems, you forget your anxiety and your distress and your anger, whatever it is. <clears throat> so I wrote an article on that, and if, a couple of months later, I'll have another idea about how to, how to feel better, if you like, and write on that. And so then when it came to writing Growing From Depression, I just, uh, in a way, I had all, all this repository of, 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 of things, and that's probably why Growing From Depression is fairly diverse. You, you, when you mentioned phenomenology, I I really loved um, a passage from um, Iris Murdoch where she talks about looking through a window and seeing a kestrel, and she's she's feeling frustrated and unhappy and brooding over the little crises that are going on in her life. And she looks out of the window, sees this kestrel, and it's hovering there, and is just drawn in that mindful contemplation that completely taken out of her ego into the contemplation of the bird mm. and and she describes you know when when it has gone and when she has stopped just that sense of her ego being that little bit less dominant being and her own problems feeling a, a little bit less contaminating after that experience of being outside herself mm, that's right i mean we we tend to uh, get, we tend to live in our heads and we can get really stuck in our heads. You know, we're always busy, we're always rushing around, we're always stressed and anxious, and we don't see the world around us anymore. And uh, it's extremely therapeutic to, 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 to pay attention to small things. And I think that if you're not seeing small things anymore, you're not truly alive. If you're not noticing small things anymore, you're, not, you're, not, you're no longer truly alive. So do you think that practices like mindfulness meditation um, might, be, might be useful for people as well? I think so, but I think mindfulness is, is, is quite tricky in, in many ways because it's, it's more in, mindfulness is more internal than phenomenology. So mindfulness is right. about paying attention to your own stream of thoughts. Um, and that, that can seem quite challenging to many people, especially people who are, who are suffering. Um, whereas phenomenology is actually much more accessible, I think, and much simpler to achieve. All it involves is uh, paying attention to something and just looking at it and seeing how it changes as you as you look at it. Um, yeah, and I think that's much much more achievable. 
that seems to me to align a little bit with what you had to say about boredom, because mm. unless you offer yourself those spaces where you're not running around and distracting yourself, mm. maybe you don't have the chance to um, smell the roses. That's right. There's a, there's a very fine line between idleness and boredom. And we have a very strange and, and uh, paradoxical relationship towards both idleness and boredom. So on the one hand, we always dream of uh, being idle. We dream of our holidays. We tell ourselves that we work hard because we want to retire. But then when we're stuck in a traffic jam, even for five minutes, we can't bear it. You know, we want to be moving. We want to be doing something. And we might even take a detour just so we can be still driving and got the sense of moving, even though the detour will actually take us longer than sitting through the traffic. So it's, a, it's quite a paradox that, and our society really um, frowns upon idleness. Um, you know, the, there's, nothing, there's nothing worse than sitting around doing nothing. And I had to teach myself that it was okay to be idle. You know, it's actually very important to be idle because if you're, you know, that's how, that's how you get your best ideas. That's how you see things. That's how, that's how you connect the dots, actually. That's how you, 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 you put things together, you assimilate things. Um, and I think you also do that in your dreams, actually. The dreams are, are very similar to idleness. Uh, they're a way of connecting disparate things together. And also we dream much less than, than, we're, than we're meant to, I think, nowadays, um, because we, we don't sleep enough. We're all chronically sleep deprived, which is terrible for us and terrible for our cognition. And we all wake up to an alarm clock. And you know that dreaming is, is, occurs during REM sleep and REM sleep is stacked up towards the end of the night. Right. Uh, actually, just before waking, before natural waking. But we all tend to wake up uh, much earlier than we would naturally wake up because we have so many pressures on ourselves. And so we wake up to an alarm clock and then we miss all that dream time, if you like, that precious dream time, uh, which is um, actually also part of the most, rest one of the most restorative parts of sleep. So uh, we're not dreaming, we're not, we're not being idle. Um, and so we don't really have much time for, for connecting the dots, for seeing the bigger picture. And, uh, and then we get stuck in a rut and we become anxious, stressed and depressed. I think that's part of, a, part of, the, of, of the problem with the way we live. You, you mentioned dreams and I know that um, Dr. Dave is, um, is, is very interested in dreams. He's been very interested in, um, in, in Jung, um, but also I, I think was, um, he has kept a dream diary for a long time and been involved in, in, in dream discussion groups and, and so on. Do you think there is a, a role to play for, for dreams in, um, in, in helping people to see maybe what they, what they really want or to understand, to gain insight into their natures? Absolutely. I think, I think uh, dreaming is a way of problem solving. So you test lots of hypotheses in your dreams. And then, you, you know, if you, if you wake up naturally, you, you tend to take them to the, to the end of the problem solving, if you like. But if you wake up to an alarm clock, you, tend, you don't solve the problem. Um, and you don't remember what, you, what you've been dreaming. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, I think, I think dreams are, are, are very important and we need to we should, be, we should be paying more attention to them, absolutely. I was interested too in what you had to say about solipsism in the book, um, which is a tendency that's increased by depression. And you mentioned gratitude as a, as a means to counter it. But I was wondering if you feel that a, a less atomized society and a greater sense of social responsibility might not just offer to ease depression, but also have, have some kind of potential to act as, in a preventative fashion. So I'm not quite sure I understand your question. It probably wasn't very clearly expressed is why. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you, you talked about solipsism as a, as, as, as a trait that's increased by depression, and I know that certainly by, by people notice, feeling gratitude or enhancing their social con connectivity, that can be eased. But I would wonder if in the society that the Western society that, that we're living, we're both in England, um, where it's increasingly atomized and where people are increasingly shut off from each other, that, that the problem of individuals being so, so cut off might increase incidents of depression. Um, and, and, and so connectivity might not just be a way to ease depression but a way to prevent yourself from from feeling so low mm. well there's a there's a lot in that question isn't it about the modern world 
and is the modern world, is modern life depressogenic, uh, so to speak? Uh, does, it, does it lead to a much higher incidence of depression? Um, <clears throat> and of course, in a way, it's quite paradoxical because we've never been more connected to, to each other. We live in huge cities of millions of people, and yet we're fairly, you know, atomized and lonely within those cities. So people are right next to us, behind the walls, but we don't really interact with them, uh, and that's that. That is uh, a very strange thing. But there's also there's also another factor about modern life, which is uh, the loss of meaning, yes. which I think is more important. And so, you know, tradi in traditional societies, I don't want to bang the drum for religion in any way, but in traditional societies, people had myths and, and, and accounts of why they existed and what the purpose of life was uh, and ways to deal with, the, with difficulties like, in, in particular, death. And now, since the Enlightenment, I mean, you know, uh, the downside of the Enlightenment, if you like, is that we are on our, we're thrown on our own and we have no purpose or meaning. And that, that can be very, very difficult to, to deal with um, for, for us. Yes, I think, and you do talk about, um, you do talk about existential anxiety in the book and that feeling of, that feeling of loss of meaning of, of you know, determining meaning is quite difficult, but for people to manufacture. Mm. So yeah, absolutely. So you know how to how to find meaning in in the modern world. Yes, yes, yes. Give us give us the uh, solution so that we can all go away happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no pressure or anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Viktor Frankl, as you know, wrote a lot about uh, how mm -hmm. to find meaning uh, in life, and yeah, I mean it's uh, it's. It, it, it's it's a hard thing, but I think we can. We need we need to think very deeply about what it is to have meaning, and I think we often confuse having a God-given meaning, and with well, we think that having a God-given meaning is the only kind of meaning that we can have, whereas yeah. actually we can also give our lives a meaning, and that meaning can be just as valid as a God-given meaning. And in fact, I've argued. In my writings that actually the meaning that you give yourself is even more uh, valuable or valid than a god-given meaning which is after all not of your choosing <clears throat> so would you suggest people involve themselves in a in a i don't know a personal analysis um a, a really sort of deep cataloging of their of their values and thoughts to to kind of find that meaning or are there uh, do you think it can it can sort of pop upon you as a in a kind of vocational way so the huh, you mentioned a vocational way i think that's another problem with our society is that you know the jobs we do are not you know we can't we can't necessarily get a derive a sense of meaning out of our job like we could out of more historical or traditional jobs so um many many jobs now are fairly abstract uh, and fairly removed from the end product yeah uh, so you know like i'm a writer and when i when i finish my book i can see what i've made i can see what i've done and i get feedback from it i can people are happy or sometimes angry um <laughs> <laughs> but at least i know what i've done and that's my meaning if you like uh and if you're a baker you can you make bread and people come and buy it and they're happy and they eat it and they, you know and you know what you've done but nowadays if you know you're, you're working in quite an abstract or quite a specialized technical job uh, it can be hard to understand where you fit in and what 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 it is you're doing uh and i think that can be really difficult in the modern world and and, and the cause of of depression you also write about how our culturally directed expectations of happiness might be setting us up for disappointment. Yes, I think um, certainly there's a huge expectation that we should be happy, that we should always be smiling, and that if we're not, there's something wrong, as we've already discussed. And, um, <clears throat> and I think the, the problem is that the, 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 you know, the, the, the idea of happiness that we have that our society vehiculates, if you like, is one that's very much shaped by commercial interests. So what does it mean to be happy? Well, you need to have a nice house, you need to have beautiful furniture, you need to 
uh, probably be um, married and have children and uh, you know have a SUV and send them to nice schools and go on four holidays a year um, and of course this is all very good for the economy but is that really happiness you know that sort of bourgeois ideal that we tend to strive for and aim for even if at the very unconscious level is that is that really happiness or is happiness more the result of um you know thinking about our place in the world and 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 uh, thinking about what it means to be alive and how we contribute to life i think there's much more in that than in this sort of bourgeois ideal of happiness that is very deeply ingrained into us by, by society you're talking about a concept of eudaimonia really rather than that rather than a, a kind of transient sense of of pleasure yeah that's right so that's a, the concept of eudaimonia for, uh, is is an aristotelian concept and it's the sort of his concept of what it means to be happy which is not about sort of smiling and laughing which is what many people think of as happiness um, but it's more about tranquility of mind it's about not being disturbed um, <clears throat> and being content and, and tranquil and, and happy in oneself um, so it's much more low-key uh, than, than many people imagine today and just one final thing before I ask you, um, before I ask you if there's anything that you'd like to add, uh, mentioning um, Aristotle, and you do um, refer in, in in that book, um, I think briefly to um, the Stoics, and I've been thinking for a while about Stoicism and about virtue ethics and about um, that the the sense of having. Uh, role models and a pursuit of a pursuit of pursuit of excellence in in being in being the best you you can be to put it in in rather fey language but um but i was wondering if if, if you feel that views like sto stoicism or virtue ethics can actually help improve people's mood if they do find themselves low or perhaps set them on a trajectory to to feel a little bit more resilient faced with the slings and arrows of fortune yeah, I think there's many there's many uh, good tools that you can you can you can mine and use from from the ancients and from the Stoics, I think in particular. And uh, one thing that 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 affects us all is bad news. <clears throat> you know, we all get bad news. Um, you know, maybe our partner leaves us, or someone's threatening to sue us, or we get a health diagnosis. Um, and let's be honest, bad news is only going to get worse as, as, we, as we get older, I guess. Okay, and, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the Stoics give us many ways of coping with the bad news, um, of, of dealing with it, of processing it. And all these ways have one thing in common, which is perspective. They, they help you to, to regain perspective, to regain the higher ground, to see things in context. And, um, and I, I think these sorts of things can be very helpful. And of course, that's what philosophy does as a whole. It gives you, it gives you perspective. It gives you context. So, have you found it useful in when you've been working with when you've been working with clients as well? Does it has it given you that that great vantage point to be able to offer them different kinds of wisdom and suggestions when you've been dealing with 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 actual patients that, who you've been working mm. with? I think sometimes it does help. But I'm a psychiatrist, not a psychoanalyst or a psychotherapist. Mm. So I'm mostly involved in sort of the diagnosis and treatment of mental disorder. And of course, that's, that's a different thing. And sometimes, of course, nuggets, golden nuggets of sort of ancient wisdom can help. But that is not the main focus of my job at the moment, uh, although it is the main focus of my writing. Um, and so I, that, that's, I think, the main way through which I talk about these things and try to vehiculate these things. I, I have read a couple of your other books, um, Hypersanity and the Art of Failure, both of which were incredibly thought provoking and as wide ranging as, as this one. Um, but you've written um, other works that were more specifically focused on, on psychological, psychiatric issues. Perhaps you could give the audience a sense of those and why they really should go out and buy them. <laughs> well, uh, I think they should go out and buy them only if they're ready for them. To be honest, <laughs> I think I think you need to be in a certain place to 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 read a book, and it helps if you're in in the right place. You know, there's a right book for the right time, so to speak. So I don't want to necessarily just push my books for the sake of pushing, 
but um, uh, did you want me to talk about hypersanity, perhaps? Uh, well, I was I was thinking really about the ones that were more specifically aligned to um, to psychological or psychiatric matters. Like you you've written on schizophrenia, I think also. Yeah, but I mean, I think I think in a way I've written some specific self help guides, as you say, growing from depression, um, living with schizophrenia, and these can be helpful to people who are in the throes of, of these conditions. But I think in a way. We, we can all improve our, our mental health. We don't, yes. need to wait. we don't need to wait until we're ill to take steps. And uh, that's why I wrote Hypersanity. It's, Hypersanity is based on this Langian concept that actually by going through, uh, by traveling through mental illness, right, but for example, by being severely depressed, we can come out the other side uh, and be more sane than sane, being hyper sane. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting, isn't it? It, it reflects um, the title "Growing from Depression," for example. Yes. Um, but the point is that if if mental illness, as Lang suggests, can lead us to a state of hypersanity, then sanity is not all it's cracked up to be. And so that's interesting. <laughs> so you know, we're all happy because we're all satisfied because we think we're sane. But but actually, there might be something else. There might be something higher than sanity. So we're all, we're all, our, all our efforts are focused uh, on getting from not being from, from mental illness to being sane. But what about trying to do something else and also at the same time moving from being sane to being hyper sane to a higher level of sanity? Uh, I think that's quite worthwhile too. That really um, improves, can improve our quality of life. And so that's why I wrote hypersanity. And what hypersanity really is about is about, you know, Lang says we can we can get to wisdom, so to speak, or to hypersanity by being mentally ill. But my premise is that maybe we can do it in another way that's less damaging and less distressing. Um, and that way is simply to think, to apply philosophy, to, to apply reason. <clears throat> and so the book starts by looking at what it, how, how to reason, how to reason well. Um, and then it looks, in the second part, it looks at, well, what are the limits of reasoning? How far can reasoning take us? Uh, <clears throat> what are the limitations of reasoning? Where do we hit a wall with reason? And the third part looks at going beyond reason, um, thinking beyond thinking, if you like, which is a subtitle of the book, and looking at, at other modes of cognition. Because in the West, we tend to emphasize uh, reason and logic as the only modes of thinking. But actually there are many other modes of cognition, like uh, the emotions, in intuition, uh, imagination, which are really, really undervalued in our society. And that actually um, <clears throat> are, are really, really powerful and can make a huge difference, um, not only to our quality of life and to our mental health, but also to our, to our contribution to the world. You know, if we had enough imagination, I mean, do you imagine, we, we, if we had a, enough imagination, we could solve all our problems. We could, um, you know, we, we, if we had enough imagination, we could, we'd, we'd have nothing to worry about. We'd have all the money we'd like, we'd have all the success we'd like, we'd have all the friends we'd like. But the thing is, we don't, we have so little imagination that we haven't imag even imagined what it would be like to have that kind of imagination. <laughs> it, it it was definitely inspiring when I met it, as you say, from right from the get go with the critical thinking analysis to and and then to the insights about intuition and insight and imagination. And if people wanted to get a taster of that, because I think this is where I first found you actually, Neil, was an um, there is a there is an article that introduces these ideas on Eon, the online magazine. Mm. And um, and so people can get a taste of that, which and that was the reason that that I went out and bought the book, and then wanted to make contact oh, right. with you. It was yeah. um, it, it I found it very inspiring, and passed it on. You, to, you read the um, article on hypersanity on Neon. Yes, yes, mm. and I passed it on to some friends of mine, and and all of them were equally inspired by it. And I think it's I think that be having permission to feel to 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 think in a new way is. Mm. is maybe something people need you know mm. as i say you know as a, as, a, as a mental health professional myself i've spent my entire career and education trying to um, bring people from you know to prevent people from being mentally ill and to make them 
to make them not mentally ill. But actually, there's more to it than that, isn't there? It's about even for people who are not mentally ill, we can improve our our mental health, and I think that's also worth focusing on. Indeed, and and it seems to me a wonderful message on which to stop. Uh, Neil Burton, thank you so much for being on Shrink Wrap Radio. It's a pleasure. Thank you for speaking to me, and thank you for your for your excellent questions. Talking to Neil Burton was fascinating for me and a great pleasure. He's a man with an open mind and broad horizons. Although his clinical work is founded on scientific principles, his awareness of how complex, multifaceted and subjective much of what goes under the heading of mental illness is makes his perspective, in my view, a particularly salutary one. This is holistic without being kooky. His profound understanding of the way in which mental health is related to socio-political, personal, cognitive and biochemical matters might seem to make this vast system of influences unwieldy, but his clarity of thinking and his desire to find the most relevant aspects for a given individual instead offers efficacy and real hope. Mental health, as he sees it, isn't just restricted to bringing those who have suffered to an OK place – Rather, it's about encouraging all of us to enhance our mental okayness into what he has labelled hypersanity, which incorporates critical thinking as much as imagination, knowledge as much as intuition. And, having mentioned hope, the idea that suffering can and often does lead to people experiencing greater compassion, wisdom and insight may well give those in the dark night of the soul enough extra encouragement to fight their demons. Perspective changes can change brains as well as minds. And a sense of meaning, it seems to me, may be just as useful as many other talking or tablet interventions. I recommend his books, Growing from Depression, Hypersanity and The Art of Failure, which I have read, and am confident his others would be well worth reading. <laughs>